Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on the topic of augmented reality in medicine, healthcare, and wellness. My name is Christine Pere, and I'll be delivering today's session for you. I want to thank the IEEE Standards Association for hosting today's webinar. This presentation is one of a series of IEEE webinars designed to inform and raise awareness about augmented reality topics in a vendor-neutral way. Today I'll be sharing with you how healthcare, the delivery of medical care to patients, and wellness can benefit from the introduction of augmented reality technology. Some of you watching today will be able to apply what you learn in this webinar to your own processes and address challenges that you face when bringing together health and human data technical information, and the physical world. Over the next hour, I'll explain why AR is increasingly relevant in the delivery of modern healthcare and personal fitness. I'll describe the phases in healthcare and medical service delivery where data visualization plays an important role and can contribute to improve patient outcomes and personal wellness. I'll explain some of the techniques in use to pilot AR in healthcare and I'll close with an analysis of the challenges ahead for those who work in this domain. I want to go over a few housekeeping items and let you know how to participate in today's session. If you've joined the webinar using your computer speaker system, known as Voice over IP, then this means you'll be able to hear the presentation without dialing in. If you'd like to call in using your telephone, just locate the audio pane use and select Use Telephone. The dial-in information and access code will then appear. You have the ability to ask me questions using the WebEx chat feature. Simply type in your question to our host, Dave Stankowitz, and click Send. At the end of the presentation, David will get to as many of your questions as possible. So let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to begin by introducing myself. I'm an independent consultant, and that means that I spend my time doing research. I try to connect the dots not only in technology in different regions of the world, but in augmented reality and adjacent domains, uh, things having to do with computer vision, geospatial information. And with all of this research, I build what's called landscapes, technology and business landscapes. And using the patterns from uh, what I detect and uh, my past experience, I introduce new initiatives initiatives that are designed to fill gaps, perhaps, or uh, to address um, uh, a conflict. I also help to establish and I moderate and lead communities, communities of people, uh, sometimes communities of companies that work together to address uh, new opportunities and challenges. And based on these landscapes and the strategic insights, I also offer consulting services. For the last year, I've been working with the IEEE Standards Association to prepare and to deliver these webinars. There are uh, now quite a few, and I hope that you've been able to find those and will not hesitate to consult and play them back uh, at your leisure. Uh, there are many topics, depending on the level of interest and uh, the stage in, in, your, uh, in your research. So please do take a moment to visit the AR in your future web page and browse those materials. Now let's go ahead and get started with today's event. I'm going to be talking to you uh, some about the background uh, behind uh, augmented reality in medical and, and, and healthcare. I'm going to then talk about some of the use cases, both for clinicians as well as for people, us. Um, people who are well and people who uh, want to improve and, and um, feel better. And then uh, I'll also be talking about the barriers to this taking off, where we can anticipate some um, major breakthroughs and the standards that are involved in this domain. Okay. You know, one of the things that, that uh, I started to think about is how early in life we understand or we come to some awareness of the medical profession. Uh, it's probably the first um, person and professional that anybody meets today when, when they arrive in, into the real world. So, and then from as long as we can probably remember, as early as the child can, can have memories that uh, we're meeting with and our parents are very much listening to the advice 
um, and the instructions of healthcare professionals. In addition, there are many things in the human body and, in fact, in all, in all um, life that we can't see. And we have the impression, at least, that people in the medical professionals have this special touch and a, a special uh, gift to see what's happening uh, behind, under the skin and, and behind the scenes. Um, so that's the philosoph philosophical side of things. Now, uh, in terms of industries and uh, what this is all about, healthcare, as we know, is continuing to expand very, very quickly. Um, we know already about the uh, uh, aging population and that as we uh, grow older, we want to stay active longer, and there are many um, interlocking components that uh, all have a financial impact and we, uh, many countries have more resources and are gradually investing more and more into the wellness and the health of their citizens. So all of these things uh, knit together and are driving the um, size of the healthcare market. Uh, let's think specifically about healthcare technology. Information technology globally um, has, be, has been growing um, I think if we looked even further back, we'd see even a, a steeper uh, growth curve uh, over the last 30 years. And this, this trend continues. Uh, today, uh, in the beginning of 2015, you can estimate that be about $400 billion will be spent in technology for medical purposes. That's not including the, the wellness and fitness segments, which we know are also very, very large. What is all this um, spending on? More and more, the, in, in the uh, information technologies that we introduce into healthcare uh, are um, being adopted in hospitals. Um, more and more records of patients are being stored electronically, and many people are able to uh, put uh, sensors on themselves and, and ask these questions of themselves and of the, uh, the, the physicians. Um, a lot of the data that's being collected today for healthcare is health is data that's unstructured. That means that um, it's uh, not in a database. It is uh, somehow stored, um, associated with some images or lab results or individual health records, and that um, there's this this is growing in, in an increasingly fast speed. And the more healthcare IT there is the more big data there is, and the more big data, the more we need the IT uh, to help us make sense of it. Um, a lot of people are using mobile devices to help them make sense of their electronic uh, health information. Physicians are more and more using tablets and, and other wireless devices uh, or mobile devices to consult the health records of their patients to um, also look at uh, what kinds of services are permitted under different policies, et cetera. This is uh, just a phenomenally fast-growing market. In addition, more and more people are getting used to using technology in their home or uh, in an uh, outpatient environment to be consulted by telehealth. So having these cameras, having these monitors, and all of this uh, is generating more and more data and uh, helping us to live better lives, but, but also more complicated lives. Now, how does this come back to augmented reality? I think augmented reality is a way to capture a lot of, dis of, of data about, our, about ourselves and to store it in, in servers, uh, to store it perhaps locally in a, in a hospital or in the cloud. And then uh, what we're seeing is that based on all of this data, the aggregate of all this data about the equipment in our medical environments, about our own personal health records, all this is coming together with um, the advancements in personal display technology, hands-free eyewear, to bring that data right into context where the, the user can see it, can interact with it. And what's being done in a more and more robust way, and what I mean by that is that uh, it's more, more uh uh, available under a variety of conditions, lighting conditions, motion movement conditions, 
the time with which uh, the delay between capturing data and displaying data is getting shorter and shorter. And combining all of these trends um, with the data management technology, the patient data management technology, all this real-time activity is just um, really driving the need to visualize the information, not visualize everything, but only what you need right at a specific instant in time. And that's really what augmented reality uh, uh, helps us with. Now, who do we help? Who does augmented reality serve? Um, the first thing I want to do is uh, propose to you a framework that I've been working on to help us understand the use cases and when and, and how augmented reality brings value. But um, the first, it's a, the first axis that we're going to look at are the users. I've begun by just uh, breaking the group into two, starting with the professionals and the non-professionals. Now, within each of these groups, of course, we could um, uh, segment it yet more finely. In professionals, we have uh, technicians, anesthesiologists, uh, general practitioners, surgeons, nurses, many, many people who are um, professionally trained. And then in the non-professional domain, we have people who are patients, people who are well, people who um, may be, find themselves in an emergency situation and, and need to use some kind of an AR-assisted system. So um, in addition, what are these users pointing at? What is it that's being enriched? What is it exactly that uh, uh, is the target of the AR experience? And I decided to just, for the moment, for the purposes of this this event, describe to you the, the that we could have instrumented tech, uh, AR experiences associated with technologies and instruments in the environment, not a human target. And then on the other side, of course, people, uh, whether they're uh, uh, sick or or well, patients, um, everyone may have some data that's of value to be consulted. So by looking at this two-by-two two framework, um, it creates a, a bit of a grid here, and we can begin to think about uh, the use cases that I'll be speaking more about uh, uh, today. And I think that this is a suggested framework for many people who are looking to deploy augmented reality or, or who are thinking of building augmented reality uh, into existing um, healthcare IT. Now, why would you do that? Why would uh, healthcare IT um, or, or anyone want to use AR? I think that the primary benefit when we boil down everything is that data visualization in context, exactly when you need it, uh, it helps with decision making. Now, you may not want to look only at information about that one patient. You may want to look at some uh, historical research, you may want to look at population um, metrics, you may want to be able to consult someone who is remote, an expert in a particular domain, um, you know, dermatology or orthopedics or uh, internal medicine, and you, you may want to access those people very quickly and ask them only about the case in front of, of you. So AR-assisted systems can uh, tap into a wide variety of data and help in real-time decision-making. And what is the impact of that decision-making, of that AR-assisted decision-making? So now I'm suggesting another way of looking at it, an another framework that I hope people will find useful. Um, let's think about uh, the, the very, very important outcomes of better health delivery um, certainly, we want to contain costs. We want to uh, avoid errors. And in the bottom part of this figure, we want to have better patient outcomes, and that often means a better informed patient and, uh, and members around them. So when, when we think about this, you have to kind of cross-connect. A lower risk of procedural errors will re reduce the cost of delivery. It also makes for a better outcome. Uh, to whatever procedure or intervention. A better informed uh, patient or family member means also we may have a fewer um, problems in the future re regarding the choices that were made and a, a better outcome uh, in the long run. 
So again, I think these are factors uh, that that people who are who are looking to introduce augmented reality into existing systems or new systems should be thinking about it in this way. Now let's turn our attention a little bit uh, to the different um, use cases for AR. And what I've done is I've divided up those use cases that pertain to um, medical and healthcare, so where the professional is involved. And I'll treat in a separate section those um, examples for wellness. You know, a lot of people, when they think about augmented reality in medicine, jump right to this um, scenario they may have read about in, in uh, popular popular press had to do with this um, local uh, surgery that's been assisted using Google Glass. And the uh, scenario is where the physician or someone in the operating theater has a Google Glass uh, uh, connected to the devices that are monitoring the statistics of the patient. And this way, they can have the data in real time without having to look at another instrument and, and look away from, from the, uh, the patient. And while I think this is extremely important and it has driven a lot of interest, particularly from very large providers of technologies like Siemens and Philips and McKesson, um, it's not the only way to think of it and it's also um, not true augmented reality. While this case uh, pertains to the patient uh, on, on the operating table, the overlay of the information isn't registered uh, precisely. If the, pers if, the, if the physician turns away, uh, leaves the room, they would still see the same information. Um, I don't want to say this is not useful. On the contrary, it's extremely powerful and, and uh, it's also spawned a, a different set of um, applications and use cases for Google Glass, which have to do with um, the patient and physician consultation. Sometimes the, there are some new technologies, new companies that are coming out with um, uh, software that will run on the Google Glass and match the patient with their records automatically, making sure that the person who we're speaking about uh, is the correct one, and then being able to scan and rapidly look at records or health uh, research results. So these are very, very valuable use cases, um, but they, they are uh, kind of different than, or, than augmented reality. When a per professional wants to use augmented reality for um, improving patient outcomes, I think there's um, the following different stages in the intervention. There's the diagnosis phase, where we are actually trying to assess uh, what's wrong. The uh, patient-specific data needs to appear and need to compare this with lots of databases uh, and have that be synchronized. There's a phase in which once we know what the uh, problem is, the diagnosis, there's the development of a treatment plan. And this using augmented reality as part of that process can help to explore options and assess what the different options, what the risk and costs are of different options, maybe even consulting with a, 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 another specialist. Augmented reality can also help to communicate conceptually complicated information to the patient and uh, help the patient to ask questions and maybe express a preference. Um, you can imagine many different kinds of uh, use cases in the patient communication. Then when the patient and the physician have agreed on uh, some kind of an intervention or uh, wellness plan, then augmented reality can also help uh, to execute that plan, to put it in place by making the procedures more accurate, um, having real-time support for those decisions, and validating if it's recorded that the uh, procedure was correctly performed and uh, re uh, even helping people who are not uh, skilled uh, learn more and training and many, many other applications that could be built upon uh, the real-time procedure. Sometimes after uh, treatment, there's still another phase of rehabilitation and augmented reality uh, is, uh, can be used to help the patient or the person better enjoy the, the rehabilitation program by introducing gamification, lets us do it at home perhaps, and where you have a computer or screen or a smartphone or something like that can be set up to, to do that and to record the results and then devise a, a new individualized treatment plan adaptive as it goes. 
as I've been doing the research in this, what I found is that there was a lot of attention and um, some past ex experiments and good proof of concepts in the treatment plan uh, design. This segment is well represented. And then uh, there are also uh, quite a lot of examples around procedures and rehabilitation programs. I'll be going over those, but I'll also uh, introduce some of the less well-known, less well-recognized um, uh, examples in diagnosis and patient communication. So what is an example of AR-assisted diagnosis? Well, this is um, a few years ago. Someone developed uh, um, using a mobile device. I believe it's an Android application that's called Dr. Mole, and a non-professional or someone who's not an expert in dermatology can use it to quickly diagnose uh, uh, skin cancer. That's a good example of where it's live, real-time information, comparing the symmetry, the border, the color and the diameter of the patient um, uh, lesion with some database and, and other images, and that way be able to bring back a result very quickly. Uh, also, there was an example in the literature of uh, using uh, x-ray and comparing that with the actual person's head and being able to overlay it and as the person is uh, uh, rotating their head and so forth, being able to show um, and to evaluate any abnormal bone growth. This is a very new article published in the medical literature and it shows how using Connect to scan the face and head, uh, combined with a Vuzix head-mounted display, the X-ray information overlays right on the head as registered, including um, uh, that the hand is not part of the, the target and the patient, so it uh, supports occlusion. When uh, you're doing uh, designing and planning of procedure, um, there's a, here's an example by uh, some folks at the Technical University of Munich. That's one of the uh, leading uh, providers and research groups for augmented reality. And what they're showing here is uh, when planning or training for some kind of an intervention in, in the, the uh, vertebrae, uh, maybe to insert a screw to uh, hold two vertebrae together, this is a, a good way of uh, estimating how the procedure should be done, preparing it. You can see this is kind of augmented uh, reality, not only the 3D model of the vertebrae, but the mirror image on the other side. Um, there was an example several years ago at the Harvard Medical School uh, using augmented reality in preparation for um, uh, surgery on the brain. These examples were uh, fairly um, uh, common and they show how uh, when you have bone and uh, rigid materials, uh, you can overlay a uh, registration and, and, and see what could be happening. There's a, another group of examples that are around the subject of uh, soft tissue. And soft tissue just really behaves so much differently than bone. We know that, right, because uh, we, we're made of both. Uh, so this group at INRIA has been doing quite a lot of work on the subject of uh, minimally invasive procedures and how to estimate how the tissue is going to change and mapping that onto the real world uh, using augmented reality during a procedure. It's ex extremely exciting from the people I've spoken with that they think this is extremely promising to help them anticipate how the tissue will react. By using augmented reality for the design and planning of interventions, we can uh, anticipate these tissue responses that I just mentioned. We can have a more rapid procedure because there's better preparation. We can have consultations with experts as well as with the patient and then have fewer decisions to make during the procedure. So we can think of um, perhaps we can also use augmented reality for patient communication. This is a short video showing how the uh, patient might not really be so familiar with what's going on inside the body and um, be able to show the patient exactly what's going to happen, what we're going to insert, how it's going to look uh, after it's done. That's, that's a good example for patient communication. Sometimes the nurse or a physician has to um, maybe do a, a put in a, a drip or, a, or give people a, an injection of some kind. 
and this um, it can be difficult to do for a variety of reasons, uh, skin color, um, small veins, et cetera. And so Avena is a company that has developed a product called uh, Eyes on Glass using the Epson Moveria um, platform, and it uh, uses infrared and near-infrared light to support uh, the visualization of vascular images. It's a companion product to, to products that uh, Avena has already been providing for, um, you know, the blood and uh, 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 those related vascular kinds of procedures in the medical setting. Now let's talk about um, probably one of the most active areas, which is the use of augmented reality during operations. Let's call that intraoperative procedures. Um, this goes back even before really people had thought or named augmented reality. It wasn't called augmented reality in the late 80s, but um, they say the first reported medical AR operating theater example was um, done in 1986. Uh, it's not the photograph here in the image. I wasn't able to find an image, but it was on a on a on a head, and um, it was it's really a landmark uh, where computer vision and and imaging could be overlaid in real time and uh, used to improve outcomes. Then just a few years later, um, Bajura and other people in that laboratory demonstrated ultrasound using ultrasound to overlay on a on a patient using the head-mounted display. Of course, at that time, the head-mounted display must have been very large, um, connected to a computer. Who knows how big that was? And uh, you know, we've come a long way. Uh, in in between then and, and now, there was also an example of uh, laparoscopy. There's a, quite a lot of AR-assisted laparoscopy examples. That's the digital image and to project an image on top of the skin and using um, uh, combining the laparoscope with a camera and a projector. Um, this has been shown from the laboratory of Henry Fuchs and others at University of North Carolina. They've continued to work in this as many others have. There was also kind of a, a very important landmark pub paper about the needle biopsy, AR assisted needle biopsy guidance system that showed that having AR assistance um, uh, performed better than without. Now, if it's so good, then are people really using it today? Well, uh, I have to say I, ha I don't have uh, quantitative metrics on that, but I see more and more examples over the last five years and over the last uh, few years. This is um, a historical one. It's 2006, published in the Atropy uh, Transactions of Biomedical Engineering about the use of augmented reality for uh, helping to guide an MIR, M MRI scan. This is in order to better understand uh, exactly where the incident is and, and how to use the instrument. Um, there's also uh, the following clip that I want to show you about interoptive. So there you can see some of the examples of the interoperative uh, use cases. Um, very recently, this is uh, late 2014, there was some material published uh, from researchers at NREA on the subject of uh, uh, being able to overlay a 3D model 
on a very soft tissue. This, in this case, it's a liver. And in order, in in being able to do this, I didn't show the video, but uh, it allows the surgeon to anticipate uh, where where to insert and and what the tissue is going to do. Um, this is extremely advanced 3D modeling uh, and highly uh, computationally intensive. But you can see the direction that this is all going, and I believe they're beginning to use that. Some people are beginning to use this um, for operations. So let's think about the metrics for AR-assisted uh, augmented reality systems like this. The speed of preparation uh, of these 3D models, these high-resolution 3D models from scan, is very important. So the X-ray example is very fast. It was real time. But there are other techniques for scanning where uh, it does take a long time to process all of the data and to create a high-resolution scan. We also want to track and keep metrics on the ability to um, track the deforming target, uh, such as that uh, liver in the most recent example, and make that extremely accurate and, and uh, responsive. It needs to be a high resolution, whether it's projected onto the human or whether it's using uh, some kind of a personal display, a head-worn, hands-free display. And there should be some uh, analyses performed after operations about how the patient um, outcome, what are the patient outcomes and the opinions of other experts. Now, uh, sometimes we uh, don't have to go through the the um, procedure to understand that uh, people who have strokes or somehow have an injury to their arm might need to have some rehabilitation. This is an example of a, a smartphone-based augmented reality rehabilitation game. Uh, so that's an example, and this is also an example of upper limb rehabilitation using augmented reality. So here the person is just placing a block in, in different places, and it's a little bit more interactive and gives immediate feedback to the user. Um, this is another example of uh, improving motor rehabilitation using augmented reality. Uh, and I think you'll see that uh, it's a, a large motor skills. And this is the example of using um, the full body mirror. And then you can also uh, help people um, adapt the therapy uh, depending on their progress. So a little bit of gamification in this example as well, as you can see. So it's coaching them and adapting uh, for that motor skill. Here's an example of a phantom limb syndrome uh, um, situation where the a user can uh, have electrodes mounted on, on their limb and using the webcam and, and, a, and a screen be able to kind of get a, and, and then they also have a fiducial marker attached to the person. And then as the arm is being moved, uh, there is a, an augmented reality experience there and uh, that is relayed and visible for the user on the screen. You can see the elbow is flexing and the hand is moving up. So that's uh, very valuable, and, and I'm pretty sure these are being used um, with great success. So uh, all these are examples of how greater data-driven procedures uh, based on large amounts of data very, uh, a variety of data, but of course, historical and real-time information can um, then be used during a procedure or during therapy and then tie that in and record that uh, back to tracing the results. We also know that augmented reality is very valuable because it's very highly adaptable. It's real-time, right? So it's responding to uh, what's happening during the procedure re rehabilitation uh, at any time. Let's think about some of the non-professional use cases. There's still medical, um, maybe training, personal health, uh, home health, if, uh, chronic care or rehabilitation. And I'll be talking a little bit more about those in a moment. But let's think of the student case where um, an anatomy lesson might use augmented reality. Um, this is a, another example of the magic mirror.
So those are a uh, few examples of how augmented reality in a um, using still in a medical and and healthcare scenario. Some other things that could be done, for example, is the treatment of arachnophobia, uh, the fear of spiders, uh, or fear of needles. So uh, I'll give you a, a little bit of a, an example in both of those cases. So here, um, this is all an augmented a virtual spider. And in addition to helping the user overcome their fear, um, the spider, the, the whole system is uh, very aware of the three dimensions in the environment. In this example, uh, as you saw, you might imagine the use of, uh, of um, augmented reality on a mobile device to treat um, fear of needles. So here's the, the needle and um, showing the demonstration and uh, overcoming that through uh, repeated exposure. This is a case of training um, physicians or nurses uh, for a femoral, you know, the femor femoral artery um, uh, the, uh, in the insertion of a needle. So um, this is an example, another example for, for training. Uh, and uh, I think these are really uh, great examples that uh, you can review and uh, study more closely. When we're thinking about training, we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that these people are not working, therefore we need to make sure that it's very valuable. Is the training accurate? Is the student's ability to repeat that high, uh, that highly complex procedure, is it uh, repeatable? Uh, is the information retained over time, retained better because of the kinesthetic learning? Uh, using augmented reality in the real world as opposed to watching a movie or uh, simply reading a, a, a document. Um, and what are the impacts of this training method with augmented reality assistance? Uh, what are the impacts when performing the task in a, in a stressful environment? Those are all considerations that I hope uh, we can get some metrics on. Um, still in the area of health, but now thinking about augmented reality in the domain of public health and epidemiology, um, there are examples there uh, of uh, applications that have been developed for the visualization of uh, air quality. And um, both of these examples are uh, uh, pertain to air quality. The top one is using the layer application uh, to see um, you know, uh, gases. And the bottom one is uh, particles, um, particle density uh, in the city of Seoul. So you could also, if you had fine grain data, you could also study or visualize the density of uh, pollen or other allergens uh, where there is disease and uh, perhaps radiation, things that are invisible to the naked eye, but that could be overlaid in real time for the user. And then uh, when those conditions appear, the user could also then ask for procedures to follow uh, that they might not be familiar with and, or where to go in case of radiation or, or other um, conditions they want to avoid. So in order to stay well, um, what can we do? Well, there's an awful lot of uh, money and attention being spent today to the quantified self-movement, and this is part of a much, much larger um, Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, uh, movement, and um, augmented reality is an adjunct. It is uh, a companion to that in that it helps us to visualize the data that we're capturing about ourselves and our performance. And people who, who are aware, who, who perform certain kinds of sports know that they do uh, have already eyeglasses um, they have special performance glasses for their light weight, uh, for the way that they respond under these conditions, you know, ski goggles, for example, or uh, glasses for skydiving. And, and electronics can be built in to make those glasses into displays. AR-assisted displays for sports is a very big field. Uh, in fact, there were, I found a recent article in IEEE Spectrum that cited uh, another article in Frontiers in Human Neuroscience that if we see information about ourselves or about competitors or key words or, um, that appear on the screen or that are, or we hear them in our ears, they um, 
uh, have been shown to bring about much higher performance. It's been quantified, and, and uh, this knowledge is very valuable, and many athletes are aware of that. So those of us who are not professional athletes uh, might want to do some just fitness indoors. This is an example of augmented reality using Microsoft Connect. It's a game called Ball Strike. And uh, there are some others on the Sony PlayStation and other platforms in which you can see, uh, compete with yourself and um, know how, how many calories you're burning. Um, there's uh, the uh, Race Yourself app for, for Google Glass that uh, has been released and is used to display your current information. So where where are you? Where are you perhaps uh, with respect to the distance you have to go or you plan to travel? And then also to be able to compare your personal history with your current performance. Are you ahead? Are you behind? And um, the bottom picture is uh, uh, while skiing, and perhaps uh, being able to record where other people are, where you have been in the past, and uh, any other competitor data. Uh, suppose that we are um, out uh, and, and we encounter an emergency that could be augmented reality-assisted uh, systems for uh, emergency assistance. This could be pro professional or non-professional, and some of the products include the patient scenarios with SimMen, um, a company called uh, Campus, uh, Campus Connect, I think, Campus Information. Uh, Smartman is another uh, product that uses augmented reality. Uh, these are there. There are probably a, a dozen or so of these for professional and non-professional users who want to um, be able to use augmented reality to correctly administer service or uh, medical assistance to um, someone who's injured or has had a stroke or something. Well, I've spoken to you now for. Uh, walked you through many different examples, and I want to tell you about some of the barriers we can anticipate. As in any case, uh, when you're talking about augmented reality, you have to think of the whole ecosystem of stakeholders. And, and this is a, a graphic that I prepared to share with you how I think that there are at least three big groups of stakeholders. Of course, the, the human, the patient, the public, is um, very important, but it's represented sometimes by government agencies, national, international agencies that are looking out for the public. There's also all of the different segments in the health services delivery, so the hospitals, the, the, the physicians, and, and many, many different kinds of practitioners. Of course, the insurance providers are concerned over on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, all those companies that provide product services and integration of that health uh, IT uh, into our lives, and all of this has to fit together to improve the quality of our lives. Um, each of, as the internet and, and as connectivity gets better and better, we're all more interconnected, uh, not only to, um, you know, in terms of billing and data sharing, but uh, in the long run to have a, a better quality of life and a and longer life. Um, just like all the stakeholders are connected to one another, the challenges are all connected to one another as well. So to address one set of challenges uh, well may mean uh, that it has an impact. It probably does mean it has an impact on one of the other compartments or groups of challenges. So for this particular vertical and these applications, I think of four areas, the technology ones, of course, those are the ones we're commonly thinking about, <clears throat> but in addition, the best practices for AR use, the regulatory environment, because healthcare is so heavily uh, monitored and regulated, and then the costs involved, um, very important to the long-term viability and to the return on investment for patients as well as providers. So just in the technology segment, we know that 3D scanning is very important for healthcare and medical applications. Many of the examples I gave you, if not all of them, involve some type of a three-dimensional uh, scanning. So that has to be uh, um, easier to use, um, easier and faster and um, more robust under a wide variety of conditions. The augmented reality display, whether it's head-mounted display or projection augmented reality or in a desktop, needs to be very strong uh, and responsive to the, the many different new conditions in a medical scenario. 
uh, I mentioned the organs that are deforming. Um, there could be light, uh, uh, bright light coming in that would interfere with certain kinds of augmented reality displays. You need to have uh, ubiquitous networking and connectivity, not only within the instruments out to the cloud, but also device to device connectivity, medical devices to augmented reality displays, um, medical devices to one another. And right now we encounter a lot of uh, lack of system interoperability, so you might be able to develop an entire silo of technology, but not be able to integrate it with your existing uh, uh, patient record management system. So what about usage and the best practices? I think there's almost, um, there's very little known and documented in this area. The patient data prior to the intervention needs to be of high quality. What quality? Uh, how much does that data, how much of it? Uh, what is the delay? And introducing um, data storage, data acquisition, um, and, and embedding those into the existing procedures and practices. It's very, very critical to the success of introducing augmented reality. Uh, although I have introduced metrics in a variety of places during my talk, I think it's difficult and many people still are working on assessing what the best metrics are. Uh, certainly we want the systems to be easy to use, um, for the data to be safe and uh, accurate and to be real time. Uh, many of the use cases require hands-free. The practitioner needs to uh, have both hands free. So uh, a head-mounted display or a headset is going to be necessary for most use cases. And the weight and, and the power and the heat, uh, all these factors in the head-mounted displays remain. And people will need to be trained on these, these systems so that they uh, are as high performing as possible. On the regulatory side, we know that there's a lot of uh, uh, important standards and companies and practitioners must comply with regulations. Uh, we don't know who is responsible when there's an augmented reality system introduced. Uh, it's difficult to um, dictate or to have these procedures evolve to include augmented reality. How are trials being evaluated? What are the metrics that are being used? And then perhaps there's more than one regulatory service or agency. And so how will that happen? How will that work when you have data on the one side, networking, connectivity, um, regulation on another, and, and uh, imaging uh, regulations? I'm, I'm really not sure um, how that's all going to work, and I think that's a bit of a mystery for everyone. And then it is very costly to do medical research, um, regardless of, of what uh, exactly the product or service is, but it needs to become, augmented reality introduction needs to be more important for um, the very large companies that can take a risk, perhaps, and they, they will need to better understand what the costs are. Um, the users also, the, the providers of healthcare services will need to understand the costs of components that I've mentioned before, such as the scanning and projecting and displays and involving the uh, billing and insurance companies as well. So as I mentioned, all of these stakeholders are going to need to work together and uh, there needs to be um, uh, open-mindedness and uh, um, collaboration. One of the projects uh, looking forward that I think is going to be very exciting and is going to contribute a great deal to the advancement of augmented reality in, in this uh, domain is uh, the virtual physiological patient project. So I think this is currently being spearheaded out of the European Union, but you keep your eye peeled for projects that are related to this virtual physiological patient. They'll be um, modeling all the different parts of the human body, and I think that'll contribute to the ability to do visualization. Let's turn for just a few minutes to the standards landscape. Of course, uh, the IEEE Standards Association knows that healthcare standards are very, very important. They're also highly diverse, and the research I have conducted indicated that there's over 50 different standards bodies, not just standards, individual standards, but organizations that are developing and contributing in some way. A lot of people, uh, healthcare IT professionals, belong to the Healthcare Information Management System Society. It's here in the middle of this figure over here on the left-hand side. That's a very important one to be uh, monitoring and to be working with. Um, 
for us, I don't think we need to be concerned with all standards. For augmented reality, uh, the most uh, relevant segments are in the standards that concern the data, the patient data, uh, the communications between systems, and imaging, particularly 3D imaging. So I just highlight here on this screen a few examples of, uh, of uh, medical data standards. These are uh, organizations or standards bodies that develop and, um, and certify that systems are uh, using clinically validated data. One of the most uh, prominent ones is the HL7, Health Level 7 Standards Organization. There's also, for research data, the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium. Should definitely look those up. And of course, there are national and multinational standards organizations. The National Library of Science is the U.S. Uh, holder and responsible for all standards pertaining to health and human services at the national level. And uh, the European Health and Fitness Association is an industry consortium that's very important in driving medical data standards. Device communications is one of the areas that the IEEE excels in. Device communications is important for interoperability between devices, the medical devices, and the information management system in the back end to verify that the uh, patient is exactly who they are, who they say they are, and to keep that data secure as it's being uh, driven around and, and um, delivered to uh, different devices or to be stored. So the IEEE 11073 and the 802.15 groups are definitely leading in these areas. There's also the integrated healthcare, integrating the healthcare enterprise, uh, that's another group, and the Continua Health Alliance are all important in device communications. Uh, in medical imaging standards, um, there is the Digital Imaging and Communications in Medicine Group, DICOM, that is uh, responsible for imaging, ha image handling, storing, printing, and, and transmitting it. There's also the IEEE P3333.2, uh, I'm personally very interested in having to do with 3D model creation using unprocessed 3D medical data and, and perhaps other types of um, unprocessed 3D data. And um, there's also the Association of Electrical Equipment and Medical Imaging Manufacturers that has its own set of uh, imaging standards. So as you can see, it's a very complicated environment, a lot of different standards um, to pay attention to even when you focus only on the data, communications, and imaging areas. Well, I hope today's uh, webinar has been valuable to demonstrate to you that AR-assisted visualization can help improve outcomes of the patient in many ways, that augmented reality for medical and healthcare is a very different domain than augmented reality-assisted wellness programs. So. Just a, a few takeaway messages on the medical and healthcare. I think for this visualization, there have to be real-time services and agreed-upon metrics, and that's still quite a ways away. Um, I think that introducing augmented reality is probably not going to happen with, unless and until it's integrated into the other equipment in the physician's office, in the hospital, in the operating environment. And that wherever and how it's integrated, uh, it will need to, to uh, support visualization on displays without the hands. Then on the wellness side, I think we need to think about how to involve um, household brands, perhaps uh, pharmaceutical companies or a drug, um, maybe uh, your drugstore. Um, and we already see some examples of that. Walgreens has some applications for wellness. And we need to um, see how the wellness area might develop new technologies that can indirectly contribute to medical uh, AR adoption. So those are my prepared remarks today, and I'd uh, love to hear if you have any questions. David, were there any questions today? Christine, we did uh, get some questions that came through. Thank you for uh, another great presentation. Um, the first question asks, what are the best sources of information that you identified during your research, and how can I stay informed on these topics? Mm -hmm. So I think um, the, there are several places I think very important. The Technical University of Munich has the Computer Assisted Medical uh, AR program. It has several different departments within that. It's a, a, a gold mine of information, so it's 
It's, I think the initials are C-A-M-P-A-R uh, at Technical University of Munich. That's one of the resources that you should definitely look at, spend more time with. Um, John Hopkins University. Uh, there's also uh, Robarts um, Imaging, Robarts Research Imaging Group. We'll be hearing from experts from um, both of those different institutions. There's a medical augmented reality blog, uh, and I uh, highly encourage everyone to go and visit that. There's regular posts on uh, interesting topics of the use of augmented reality in the medical field. Those are some of the places that I think are the best. Christine, uh, question number two asks, it seems that augmented reality for patient communication has a great deal of potential. Do you have any insights about the low usage to date? So I guess, um, you know, how come we haven't seen more early adopters? Right, right. Well, I think that's a uh, very good question, and it's it's a challenge because um, I think it's at the juncture between clinically validated information and information that is um, not validated. Um, I think there's also reluctance in the part of the experts, the professionals and healthcare profession, to uh, use consumer devices for the delivery of healthcare. There's already a lot of um, uh, people who are going on the web right now and trying to evaluate and diagnose themselves and try to uh, uh, assign their own remedies, um, their 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 own treatment plans. And so perhaps there's some reluctance there. I just don't think there's been a lot of um, uh, of research in the area. It's a, it's really uh, surprising, and um, there should be more research in that area in the future. And I hope that that uh, some people will be investing in that very soon. Question number three, Christine, um, is about a gentleman who works in a medical lab. He is asking. Um, you didn't suggest any examples of augmented reality use, but I can think of many. How can you recommend I introduce AR into our medical lab processes? Wow, um, opportunities uh, never end. So I think that introducing augmented reality, you really have to start thinking about the use cases and make sure that the real world is involved in a very, very tangible way. Um, so first look for places where perhaps there's some instrumentation, some uh, machines that you use rarely that could have an augmented reality assisted uh, user guide. That's one place I would look in a laboratory. Another place might be where there's, um, uh, you know, some automated procedure that is complicated and hard for people to uh, follow along. So augmented reality might be able to help people um, remind them of the steps in a procedure uh, for some kind of laboratory analysis. Those are a couple of ideas. Thanks, Christine. And we do have um, we do have just a couple minutes left, so time for one more question, and then uh, I will let you take us out. This one's a little difficult, um, hard to pinpoint an answer on, but uh, let's see. When do you think augmented reality in healthcare and medicine will become commonplace? Your best guess. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dave. Well, I, this, this is always a, a difficult to estimate. I think it depends on the use cases. Uh, it depends on the country and the sophistication uh, of the system and uh, the reliance on information technology, the data that it's generating. I'd say in Western Europe, we're likely to see this come to fruition sooner than other parts of the world. I think that um, we can expect that there'll be uh, already many uh, examples uh, uh, in the next year in orthopedic surgery. You saw some examples more and more taking place also in um, some of the very, very, very sophisticated surgical procedures in the brain and the heart. Um, I don't think it's going to be commonplace uh, for a long time, maybe a decade, but those are areas in which um, it seems to be the action is the hottest. And we'll be hearing much more about that next week. This today, this concludes today's webinar presentation. Uh, next week, the discussion about this topic will continue. Please join us for the AR in Your Future episode on Thursday, January 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern. The IEEE 
Standards Association is hosting a live Google Hangout panel discussion with experts about augmented reality and the human body. Uh, they'll be discussing experiences they have in the AR-assisted medical research and clinical pilots. They'll have much better insights into when this is going to um, happen and become mainstream. They'll share success stories and uh, talk about the technical issues as well as cultural and business issues that they encounter. It should be a very lively and engaging talk. Please feel free to join us um, next week and watch our Google Plus Hangout. For more information on viewing today or tomorrow or next week's session, visit the IEEE Standards Association Google Plus page. Thank you again to the IEEE for giving me the opportunity to bring you today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.